All right, solar eclipse. Going backwards. Okay, so uh, this is where the eclipse is happening. Eclipses happen. Eclipses happen all the time. Uh, several of them per year. Uh, we're fortunate now that it actually happens where it's visible around the U.S. Usually, they happen out in the Pacific, um, and you have to go way out there to see them. Uh, the nice thing is that in Chicago, we'll get about a 80% totality, totality, and I'll show you what that means in a second. Uh, to get the, to the best totality is that band, the black band in the middle. That means the full disk of the sun will be eclipsed. And the beautiful part there is that for those few seconds, you can look at the sun with your naked eye. I don't advise to doing that because it's literally a few seconds, and if you're off, have blind spots for hours. But when that happens, you get a corona effect. You get a black disc and a corona effect, and I'll show you what that is. Um, and it happens to go straight through the town of, uh, slightly south, just by a few miles from the town of Carbondale. So Carbondale, Illinois, who doesn't know who that is, that's the extreme southern edge um, of Illinois, down by Shawnee Forest. Probably all heard of where Shawnee Forest is. We have photographers that go there. It's a wonderful place. It's even more south of Shawnee Forest. It's literally almost at the border of Illinois, way down there. Um, the only thing that we know Carbondale for is there's a school down there, right? Southern. I think I think the town is Southern Illinois uh, University. But it's going to go through there. And if you can follow the, uh, the university online, they're doing a whole bunch of uh, events and fun stuff and everything to to yeah, get right. a dorm room for four hundred bucks. <laughs> dorm rooms. It's funny because uh, four hundred dollars under dorm room. My wife went out east to, to see her grandbaby, so we were online and uh, looking at uh, hotel prices. This is about three, four weeks ago. Everything in Carbondale was booked for like an eighty mile radius, and anything like you could stay in St. Louis for like one hundred and eighty dollars a night. Which is ridiculous, because if anyone stayed in St. Louis, $50 a night is high for St. Louis. So anyway, yeah, everything is totally booked. Uh, I'm planning to, to just, my, my, my sister-in-law lives in, in St. Louis, close to St. Louis. I'm going to drive there Sunday and be ready for the uh, one hour event, and then drive back home. Anyway, so with a black uh, part phase there on the map is where the totality will occur, and it does occur go through a lot of large cities, miraculously, or, or close enough. Um, goes through cities of Tennessee, South Carolina, um, into uh, Nebraska, very, very close to Omaha, and, and out west. So lots of big chunk of the US is covered. And I guess, the, the, again, the farther up the north or south of that solid black line are, you are just less of the totality you will see, OK? And I'll show you what that means. Um, this, everything you see, by the way, in terms of cool charts are from the NASA website. They have a really, really cool uh, simulator online um, that you go on there, you enter, you can, you can uh, enter any zip code and it'll tell you exactly how it's going to look um, from your location. Okay, so we don't care about the rest of the US, we can only care about the US, uh, the, uh, Illinois. So there's Carbondale. Um, I think that's the largest town down there. Everything else is pretty much farming communities. Uh, and you can see it's very, very close. It's within a few miles of the center of, uh, uh, of uh, Carbondale down there. So uh, it's a, I don't know, six hour drive for us. Uh, but I think it's worth it if you can make it out there. And again, it's like midday, so you can go there if it's possible. You know, leave in the morning, come back at night. I'm sure I-57 will be packed as everyone will be going down there to see this event and coming back. So it does touch the, the southern edge of Illinois. This is the same NASA simulator. Again, you enter uh, your zip code, and they'll give you a simulation of what you will see. Uh, on the left is what we will see in Chicago. Okay, so if you're going to look at uh, the eclipse in Chicago, you will see about you know 75, 80 percent um, totality. Totality is the you know how much of it will be shaded out by the moon. 
Um, the nice thing is, you know, you can slide it back and forth, and it moves the moon back and forth so you can see, simulate exactly how much of the disk you'll be able to see. The picture on the right is in Carbondale. So as you can see, in Carbondale, the whole disk will be uh, uh, shadowed. The cool thing when that happens is uh, all the flaring that occurs around the sun that you normally don't see because the sun is so bright, you just see a disk in the sky. Now that the disk is going to be shadowed, you see all the beauty around the sun, the flaring out of the disk itself, which is going to be very, very beautiful, and that's going to be the opportunity for the best shot, uh, photographic shot. Um, and that only lasts uh, literally for a few seconds. And then you know, the moon will shift, and then it'll start getting brighter and brighter on one side. Okay, beautiful website, nasa.gov. I think it's uh, Jets Propulsion Laboratory at NASA.gov. But if you go to NASA.gov, there's a link on there on the Eclipse. It takes you to Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, facility, and that's where they did all this, which is really cool. All right, how do you an Eclipse? So, um, as you all know, I've been doing astrophotography for probably two decades. Um, one year, uh, I accident, I went down there, probably uh, somewhere in southern, uh, somewhere around Springfield, I think. Forest Preserve that uh, an astronomy club meets out there a lot. And we were there for uh, a weekend uh, to shoot. And I had um, a, a maximum telescope, a similar telescope that I had now, fully electronic. I don't have it anymore because I'm getting old and it was too heavy to, to lift and take that on anymore. And I set it up during the day. Um, my uh, tent with the bag that I used to put on there just to keep it safe until it turns night. Uh, was wet, so I put it on the, on the grass, so the thing was there uh, all by itself, the telescope, and it, it, it was all set up, and I just happened to be pointing over there, and I sit you know, next to my tent, read a book, whatever I was doing. The sun had traveled enough uh, so that for a particular moment, I was sitting there reading a book, and the guy goes, hey, your telescope is smoking. I thought it was you know, some guy making fun, so I look over, and my telescope was smoking. Um, the sun had come in front of the telescope. I did not have the uh, uh, lens cover in front of my telescope because it was wet. It was with my telescope cover uh, in the sun, getting dry. And it had, was hitting it straight in, and the eyepiece was smoking. So of course, I ran there, you know, put a bag over it, took the eyepiece out. The only damage that had occurred was the eyepiece. I mean, it, it was metal. And uh, glass, and it was literally melted. Wow. So if I would have waited longer, the, the the path, the heat path, would have gone into the telescope itself and melted four thousand dollars. So I was lucky; it only melted eighty dollars. And it was by pure by chance, you know, pure stupidity on my part. Um, but that is the kind of danger, you know. You can envision uh, your camera, you know, being the telescope, and your eyeball being the eyepiece. You know, the kind of damage that occurred if you look at it. And you know the most um, accidents you'll see, and you'll hear on the news on Tuesday, you know, people having accidents with their cameras and stuff, is because they built a device that was not good enough. It slipped out, it fell, someone bumped into their camera, and whatever lens cover they were using fell off, and it, you know, just seconds is enough to hurt your eye if you're looking at, it, at that. So I've got two videos I got from YouTube that'll show you how to build something good construction-wise homemade. Looks very homemade. But it's at least good enough so that you can safely take photographs and view the sun. So I heard this morning that Walmart on Randall Road had about 150 of those sunglasses in. And they were really cheap. They were like a buck, 79 or something. Which normally they're like 39 cents. But for this weekend, they're about a buck 79. This was this morning, so I don't know if they still exist or not. Um, and they, they sell them in packs of 20 and stuff. So how to look at it? You can't use glasses, obviously. You, you cannot use glasses to look at the sun. And the problem with the eclipse is it's, going, it's so uh, deceiving because the disk is going to slowly get darker and darker as the moon comes in front of you. You're going to say, oh, it's OK. It's just for a second. Um, but it's very deceiving because when you're staring at it, seconds tick away. And then all of a sudden, you got you know the brightness of the sun uh, staring into your eyes. So it's those are the kind of things you have to worry about. So sunglasses are not good. Um, 
those uh, Eclipse classes that have been selling, I went on Amazon today and they didn't have them, they were all sold out. So, you know, the you know, Best Buys and the Walmarts and Targets, bring them in as they can to get ready for Monday. And they're really inexpensive. Um, just make sure you get good ones. We'll come to that in a second. The other thing you will see a lot is pinhole projectors. Um, and schools are very popular doing that. Um, and I'll show you how that works. But those are really, if you're going to look at it, you know, it's, it's tough to, you know, when you you got to look at the moon, kind of see it to, to stay your camera, you have to have either eclipse glasses or use the pinhole method to get to where the sun is before you use, you know, your camera on it, okay? So you'll see a lot of people with either glasses or these pinhole devices um, being used on Monday. So what is a pinhole? I mean, I did this when I was in high school, I believe. Um, basically, you're taking the image, you're making it through a, a little pinhole, and it's literally just a pinhole on some construction paper. Hopefully, it's like single ply. It's not the thick double ply with the corrugation. Lid. It's like single ply construction paper that you can get at an art store. Um, and then it will project the image. So you're using basically the pinhole paper as your focus there to go back and forth to whatever projection device you have. Um, and then once you get it in focus, you can do this while it's full sun. Right, get it in focus, now you can see the sun, and the only thing you have to do is kind of tilt the paper as the sun is moving, and then you can actually look at it, and it does give you a beautiful, shows it in color there, but it's more like black and white image of what it's gonna look like, so it does show you the whole disc. Um, I've done this, I've never seen it in totality, what it's gonna look like with the totality, so I'm look, very eager to see the folks that have a pinhole projector, what it's gonna look like, I and mean, does it totally disappear? and it totally comes back like a lunar disk or something. I've never actually seen that before, so that for me, that's gonna be cool to see. Um, I love these things, because you, you should see these around the planetarium. They, they put their head in the box, um, and then it comes and it projects on the back of the box. So you see these guys with the hat, but then, that obviously makes everything dark around them, right? It's like a light shroud that we use, um, and it gives you a much nicer image of that. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's funny to watch all, all these folks with these boxes on their head going like this to try to get to the, the sun behind them. But, you know, I've heard that that's the coolest thing to be able to do because obviously if you're out in the sun uh, light doing this method, you're going to get some fade uh, because of all the light around you going on that pinhole projection. Whereas this, you're getting just a pure shadow that you're going to be really close to look at. So that's what pinhole projection is. Um, I think it's pretty cool because it's so easy for everyone to do. You'll see a lot of these out there on Sunday, hopefully. All right, what about us? So we have glasses. We have, uh, I think he made those glasses. They don't look like he bought those glasses. I think he just has the film around his sunglasses is what it looks like. But anyway, um, that's a Canon, I think it's a 600 millimeter F4. That's what it looks like from here. Um, or it could be a 500, I can't, I gotta see it sideways, but if you ever go shooting uh, eagles at, at the Mississippi in January, February, March, you know, you see these lenses all the time. They're just literally lined up with all these guys with these lenses shooting eagles. Do you have to be camouflaged, don't you? Um, yes. <laughs> and it must be color coordinated, you know, if you're... Could I have cost the price of a car? Yeah. <laughs> it, it is an expensive lens. I think it's about $17,000 or something. Oh, yeah. um, That's crazy. But, you know, it's an L quality, you know, white lens. I'm sure that red stripe is 10000 just for that red stripe. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a I mean, it is a gorgeous lens. And, you know, I get to play with it in, in January uh, on the Mississippi. Uh, but it is 600 millimeters, um, and, and that's key to what they're trying to do, because um, if you look, if you try to take a picture of the moon with our cameras, if you have a 200 or 300 millimeter, the size of the moon on your picture is really small, right? We all try to take pictures of the moon uh, with our cameras. And you're going to get the same exact effect um, when taking pictures of the sun. Why? Well, the moon is almost the same exact size as the sun, right? That's why we're having an eclipse. So in terms of size, perceived size, I should say, um, of those objects, are all, they're almost the same. So if you're taking pictures of the moon, that's how big it's going to be on your camera, right? Doesn't matter if the sun is thousands of times bigger than the moon. 
uh, it's so much farther that it makes them look the same size. So the longer you can, the better. If you have a cropped camera, that's even better, right? Because it gives you one and a half or 1.6 times bigger image on your display. Uh, so the more focal length, the better. Okay. Um, I love that. That's a, that's not a crop camera, um, but uh, that's an awesome lens. All right. Any questions? Oh, let's see what he did. So he did what I have here. I just have the glass version of it. He did the film version of it. I would look, prefer to have that because it's a little bit more uh, easier to use. So. This is basically a telescope solar filter. So you can see, you cannot see through this, right? I mean, it's, it's almost like welding glass. Uh, it's actually is welding glass. I mean, he's selling this for 50 bucks versus a $8 piece of welding glass. Uh, so I put this in front of my telescope. I'll show you that after the uh, meeting, how that works. But um, you can't see through this at all. If you put this in front of your telescope, you put this in front of a camera lens, you cannot see through this. Um, but it does give you a beautiful white light projection of the sun. And because it is a white light projection, you can easily see sunspots with this filter, which is why I love shooting through this in a telescope. Because I can see sunspots in some beautiful detail. Um, others prefer the bottom version of this, which will give you a yellow disc. But the problem with the yellow disc is the yellow and the black kind of give you a gray image of the sunspots, it's kind of preference. The best, of course, is the, I forget what it's called, but it gives you uh, an orange. It's got fluoride in it, it gives you an orange view, but it's the clear <coughs> but it costs thousands of dollars. So uh, I love the white light. These are very inexpensive. That's the film he's using, and the film is, uh, well, it, now it's like 30 bucks for an eight by eight inch piece of film, but normally it's a few bucks for an eight by eight inch film. Why do you prefer that sound? Because um, it's more flexible. This is, you're stuck with the whatever diameter this is. Notice he's got um, pins yep. that you can change up to an inch-ish. Mm -hmm. So you can take it to another device that, you know, I think that the, circumferen the, the circumference of that lens hood is just a little bit bigger than this. So this won't work. So if I had something that, like that that will give me more flexibility, I'll put it into another lens that is not this. Um, I've been guilty of just laying this in front of my lens camera and just letting it stick there. Uh, you'll see a lot of people doing that, but that's really dangerous because, I mean, there's going to be a billion kids out there, right? Mm -hmm. All with glasses and not being able to see. If you're just laying this in front of your glass, and I've had this happen, but not while looking at the sun, um, someone will bump it, bump your camera, bump, you know, hit your tripod um, uh, leg, and this will fly off because it's literally just laying on the lens. All right, so that's the danger with something like this if it's not custom fit exactly for your hood, your lens hood. Versus that, you can see the, the pins, I've seen pins up to an inch. So, you know, he's got an inch or more capability of going to another and, and passing it on. So if that was too big for a camera, why couldn't you just kind of duct tape it? I could. You could see, you know, some of the stuff is falling out. I've tried all okay. that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then you got duct tape so, residue. Same if the whole lens wasn't covered, for instance. Would you be okay as long as you kind of black out? No, you do have to black out your whole lens. So it's, this has to be, whatever you put in front has to be bigger than your lens hood. Okay, okay. Okay, or whatever. If you don't use a hood, I mean, you have glass. Yeah. So if you use something like, here's my lens. I don't, I don't even know where the hood is. Um, but so, you know, basically what I was doing was this. Okay. It works, right? I mean, you have to, you can't do something like that, right? Okay. right? You, it has to cover the entire lens. So this works as long as you're pointing up and it's kind of stable. But if someone kicks the tripod, this will fly off. If it flies off while you're looking at the sun, you're in trouble, right? So yeah, I can take this and duct tape it on there. I wouldn't use this lens, but I use a bigger yeah. lens with a bigger foot. But uh, yeah, I guess I could do that. I've done that. You know, I've even done the inside, put some weather sealing stuff, but then you know, year after year you change lenses, you change hoods, and now you're stuck with all that crap in the inside of your there. You know? So it's ideal to get something like that. It's really inexpensive. You can, on Amazon, get homemade kits like that. You can buy the, the base, the, the actual metal piece, however, however big, they come in at four, five, six, seven, eight inches. Very inexpensive. And then the film, like now it's expensive, but, uh, 
normally it's, it's you know, 10 bucks. You can get that battery phone, the solar phone, and build your own. Um, and I'll show you in the video how to do that. It's really simple to do. But yeah, but you want to cover your whole hood. You want to make sure it's steady on there. If you're going to, you know, if you're doing it from your backyard, it, it's okay. Well, even in the backyard, I keep my tripod a few times, right? So, um, so there's danger. You know, there's inherent danger and, and safety is, is key. But yeah, it's a beautiful setup. Questions? I'm sorry. How about a neutral density? Um, good question. I mean, all these questions are covered in the video, but I will. Um, so you can get a 10 stop filter, okay? They're kind of expensive, but you can get a 10 stop filter um, and minimally can use it. It's still going to be very, very bright. Um, and it's still going to give you a lot of diffraction patterns because it's just too bright, right? Could be sandwich of 10 and maybe a 6 together. Yes, you can couple of them. Um, and again, how you couple them, you know, gets the danger, right? Can I put like nine threes together? Sure, you, you can, oh, but you've got to make sure they don't fall off while you're looking at the, you know, at right. the sun. Um, they recommend, you'll see the video, they could recommend a 17 stop minimally. Um, and unfortunately, that's several hundreds of dollars. That's really, really, really expensive. Um, so 10 stops are very, very popular, right? We right. use them for waterfalls. You can get two 10 stops and put them in the front, I guess. Um, so, but they recommend minimally a 17 stop. So, wow. okay. yeah, just to be safe. Yes? You said Walmart on Randall Road. Uh, which Walmart? Uh, the one to, to closer towards Lake Street. South Road. Okay. Right, Bowles South Road. Yes. By what Bowles? Yes, oh. Bowles Road. Yeah, oh, the okay. one in South Road. Not the one farther south towards. Yeah, the one on the north side. That one had them this morning. All right, so here's more of what I was talking about. Um, the person on the left kind of made his own, right? He just put, he got a cup. You just need that filter um, and put it in front uh, over his uh, entire lens and pretty, pretty safe, pretty, depending on the cup, uh, pretty easy to use and pretty safe. Look through the lens and look at the camera. Um, the one on the right, um, it looks to me like that, that is much, much larger than a lens, but really hard to tell. Um, but he does have the screw, so maybe you know, yeah. it's screwed securely over his lens. Um, so lots of ways. We're we'll probably on Monday going to see a lot, a lot of different ways of doing it. You know? So that's one of the, part, the cool parts of being out there, too. Um, lots of different kinds of material. They all can kind of give you either a different colored image or uh, a different, uh, I call it density, but um, because I look at sunspots a lot, uh, but you know, it gives you a slightly different image. Most of these all give you a, yes, uh, a white image, okay? The yellow image ones are better, more expensive. The orange image ones are really expensive and they're the best. And I don't think you get a film for that, maybe you can. Um, all different kinds of film, um, and you don't have to use, again, like you can use neutral density filters or welding glass. You can use welding glass too, uh, which is really inexpensive. Uh, but whatever you use, you have to use something that looks almost unbelievably cannot see through. Uh, but when you point it at the sun, you can. Okay, size on your image. So that's kind of what you're going to expect. So you know, I shoot the moon pretty regularly at uh, three, at 400 times one, so four, five, or a little bit of 520 millimeters is what I shoot the moon in. So you can see what the moon image on my camera is, right? Uh, so that'll give you a 600 millimeter, which is pretty good, 800 thousands. Uh, the telescope I'm going to be shooting at is 1800 millimeters. Uh, so you'll give you an idea using a telescope, you can really push it on, on a clear, beautiful image. But uh, it's just, and, and if you, if these, are, if this is the focal length of your lens, but you're going to use it uh, on a crop camera, you know, you have to multiply the numbers, it gets even better. So this is kind of what to expect. As long as you get a good focus, um, the, the, even with a 200 millimeter lens or a 300 millimeter lens, which are very, very popular today, uh, you'll get a really good image because you know our cameras are now what 20 megapixels or higher. 
when you crop that center image, you'll still get a, a lot of megapixels creating your image. It'll be pretty good. The key is focus, right? The key is focus. And the way you're gonna focus is the way you focus with the moon. Uh, you have to, if you're gonna look at the moon and you want your image centered like we all do, you wanna make sure the focus point is at a barrier of light to dark. And what do I, where's my phone turn? Dark, where's my phone <laughs> Basically, if this were the moon, you know, reverse it, right? The moon is going to be um, uh, very bright in the middle, very dark outside. You basically go at the edge. That's your, the edge is the best place when you focus the moon. If you're uh, doing you know, a half moon at, at, anywhere else, you want what's called a terminator, right? The line of the moon that makes it the dark part. That's where I focus at. So even though my image is centered, I move my focus point to be somewhere um, on the barrier of light to dark. Okay, that's exactly what you want to do with the sun. Um, and you can do the same thing. You're not going to see that big flare uh, until it's eclipse time. So, you know, set it up. Set up your, your, your um, uh, camera equipment, you know, way before ahead of time, at least half hour, and get the focus because the focus is not going to change, right? So focus once and put it on manual so the focus is permanent. You don't want to autofocus, right? Because just like autofocus, it's just going to keep jumping around because it doesn't know really what you want. So put it on manual focus. Uh, put the sun with your setup, but and then focus somewhere around the disc. Okay, that'll give you the sharpest focus. Okay, you're not going to see much else until this starts happening. Then you're going to see um, a lot more of a terminator, as I call it. Uh, it's really not an astronomical term, it's a terminator. But then you can like sharpen it just a little bit. Um, what I do with my cameras, um, I have you know the live display view. So I'll put the live display on while in focus, in manual focus, put my live display on. Zoom all the way in. You know, I always tell people, don't do that because it's digital zoom and it really is horrible. But in this case, you want to zoom all the way in. The image becomes grainy, kind of like flurry, bounces around. You see the whole jet stream magnified on your uh, camera. Uh, if you're in Carbondale, you're not going to have much of a jet stream. Um, and then do the same focus. Focus manually, okay? If you're brave, you can wait until the moon starts coming in. As soon as you get a little part into the sun, do a little fine focus. A little, a little fine focus there, okay? Now, of course, the sun is moving, right? So you're gonna have to keep adjusting your, your tripod to follow the sun. Um, but just as the moon is starting to come into the disk and you start seeing a little bit black, fine tune your, your focus then. Okay. Again, you're in manual. You, you don't want to jump it to auto. Um, I've seen people do tricks like do a first in auto, then switch it to manual, then do a final manual. Whatever works for you. You know, I like going manual. I'll put live view on. Uh, zoom it all the way. Zoom on the terminator, the, the boundary between the blackest and the whitest you have on your image. Uh, do the best manual focus there and leave it alone. Okay? Because then you'll be, you know, um, moving with the sun, moving the camera, moving with the sun, taking pictures. Um, you know, I, I know people that time lapse it. You know, you have uh, fancy remote controls like this that have built in timers with it. So if you have something like this, you can uh, time it to take a picture every 10 seconds, every 30 seconds. You don't have to worry about it. I know people that just do it manually. You know, look at their clock, take a picture every 30 seconds. You know, during this hour, just so they have a nice time lapse image um, of the occurrence. Um, I'm going to take a video. Um, I think our cameras can take up to what, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of video. Um, what I'm going to do is start it as soon as the moon starts coming into the disk. Start the video, let it go for 20, 30 minutes. At the totality, I'm going to turn the video off, take some pictures, um, and then turn the video back on and let it go. I do have a tracking tri tripod, <laughs> so I don't have to worry about it tracking the sun. Um, so that's one concern I won't have. Um, because in an hour, it's going to move, move enough that you know, it won't be centered. But that's what it's going to look like on your display, on your image, um, and on the final outputs. But again, if you're somewhere in the 300 or 400, that's okay. The focus is, I'm sorry, the key is focus. 
right? Get the best focus, put it in manual uh, that you can, because the one you crop, it'll look really, really good. Yes, Doug? Why wouldn't you just do a land-based infinity focus first? Um, yes, and I was just speaking with a gentleman that realized infinity is not really infinity <laughs> on our cameras. Um, so yes, you could put it on infinity. Um, some dollars go beyond infinity, have we noticed, on our lenses, which is poor. Um, but you can you can go to infinity and, and go from there. Um, I mean, but focus, shoot trees off three miles away. And, and yeah. And, and then get your infinity focus, put it off. Sure, absolutely. You can you know, shoot a, a tower that's very far away. That's the key, right? It can't be close. Very, very far away. Um, focus on that and then fine tune it when you're ready. But yeah, on a lot of our lenses, and especially our inexpensive lenses like these, this is, I don't know, a Canon, this is not a Canon. This is a very, very, very old Sigma uh, zoom lens. I noticed infinity on this is not infinity because it goes beyond infinity. Infinity and beyond. Um, which, so it's kind of poor. That's why I like shooting with telescopes rather than with lenses when I do astrophotography because of that. Okay, any other questions about what we're going to see uh, on our image? Yes? Um, what about uh, variable neutral density filters? Variable neutral density filters. Um, I don't use them, so as long as, you know, obviously you want them at maximum, right? You want to get the most stops possible of that. So they go up to a thousand. They go that far. Yeah. But how many stops is that? Not a thousand stops. Yeah, that's apparently what it means, I guess. That doesn't make sense. It's like NB2 is two stops, NB4, four, four stops. And these go from, say, four to a thousand. I, I don't know. I don't use them. And it doesn't seem right mathematically wise. On some of those neutral density filters, though, when you put it at maximum, because a neutral, a variable neutral density filter is two polarized filters that they put back to back, so that's what makes it like dark. If you get to a certain point, you're going to get a distortion where it gives, gives you a big X through um, through your image if you put it at maximum. So make sure that the one that you get, you can go to maximum because I know with mine, I have to back it off. So what does it safely go to? I would say 10 safely. Um, it may go a little bit more than that. So it's probably better just to get a 10. It, you know, it, it, it depends. I mean, the, the 10 stop is going to be a better glass than the variable. Yeah. The, having the two polarizers there, it's going to give you a sharper, less distortion, less distorted image. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's a price-based thing. You could also get a variable neutral density filter for 100 bucks versus two or three hundred for a ten stop, or a decent ten stop. Right. All right. I, I love this image. Obviously, it's not real, uh, but it kind of will give you an idea of what we're going to see. Uh, so you know, you'll have the sun. Uh, in most of our filters, it won't look orange. It'll look white, um, and then you'll see parts of the sun uh, starting to get eclipsed. Uh, until the center, where you're basically going to see a black disc with the corona around it, and then the reverse happens. This will happen all in about an hour. Okay. All right. I don't have all this fancy equipment, so I found a couple of videos that people that do have a lot of fancy equipment than me, so we can watch. August 21st, 2017, there's going to be a full total solar eclipse in North America. So right now, you should figure out how to take pictures of the sun so that you can be ready come the day of the eclipse. Check out this map to find exactly when the eclipse will be in your area and how long it will last. All you really need is some solar film. Cut the solar film to size and tape it over the front of your lens. If you plan on regularly shooting the sun and your lens supports them, invest in a front screw-on solar filter. Match the filter size to your lens's front element. I can't stop it when I'm trying to. Um, what he did was okay. Uh, if, you, if light is going to seep in from the sides, you're going to get some uh, uh, weirdness in your image, right? Um, I prefer covering the whole uh, spot, not doing what he did. He cut it exactly the size of it. Right. I, I like to go just, you know, a, a millimeter or two beyond on every side, so when I tape it, it tapes over it so, you know, light doesn't come into your lens. It doesn't flare 
You can also use a glass filter on the front of your lens. They're more expensive. And the film filters are actually sharper. The glass filters just tend to be a little more durable. They won't tear as easily, but they will crack if you drop them. Do not use regular ND filters. They are not designed to block all ultraviolet and infrared light, and using them could damage your sensor or your eye. Don't use a rear solar film filter, or you will burn right through it. Learn that the hard way. You'll want to watch the eclipse between shots, too, so buy solar sunglasses. Make sure they're ISO certified so they block IR light that might damage your eyes. Put your camera on the biggest tripod you have. Okay, you could handhold, but you'd be surprised how hard it is to handhold, especially because you're going to be cropping way in. If you find it hard to make really minor adjustments to your tripod head to keep the sun in the frame, try adjusting the legs of the tripod to line the sun. You'll need a telephoto lens, too. If you don't even have a telephoto lens, this Opteca mirror lens is only $120. What I have here is a Canon 500mm f4 with a 2x teleconverter, and then I put on a micro four thirds body, so now I'm at about 2,000 millimeters, and I'm still going to have to crop because the sun's like the biggest thing in the solar system, but it's still pretty far away. <laughs> so, what I don't want you to do is to get an SLR and look through the viewfinder. If you have a mirrorless camera, use the viewfinder. If you have an SLR, always be using live view because I don't want you to be magnifying the sun. It's going to be really powerful through the viewfinder. Do not look through the viewfinder, even with solar film, because you don't know that solar film could just uh, fall off. Now, with solar film covering the front of the lens, we're going to get the sun in the frame. If you have a hard time finding the sun, Put your eyes in the shade of your camera and look down your lens to line it up with the sun. The sun moves, so if you get the sun in the frame, a couple of minutes later it's going to be solidly out of the frame. I have the lens at f8. It doesn't so much matter if I've set it down too much or you'll suffer from diffraction and lose sharpness, but be wide open or one or two stops down. Focusing is actually really hard. If you can autofocus, that's great, but you might not really be able to rely on it. Um, so what I do is I use the viewfinder magnification feature here and I zoom in all the way and then I manually focus just to make sure that it's as good as it can possibly get. Then let the camera auto expose on the sun, but look at the histogram. You might have to adjust the exposure compensation down so the sun isn't overexposed because you want the sun to be a nice orange disc. You do not want the sun to be overexposed. So look at the histogram and make sure that it looks like this histogram. Then choose a delayed shutter. It's going to be really shaky on a tripod with a telephoto lens, so use like a 10 second delayed shutter or so. If you don't want to use a delayed shutter or you get tired of just being in the sun, fire up the Wi Fi app on your phone, connect your camera, and then you can remotely control it from the shade. And when you're ready, you push the shutter button. And don't move. Don't walk around or you'll shake the ground a little bit. It's really hard to get it super, super clear at this magnification. A hundred pictures isn't too many. See that sunspot in the lower right corner? That's AR2665, and it's 19 times larger than the Earth. That's the kind of amazing thing you can see when you photograph the sun. Okay, so it took one picture, now I'm going to take more pictures because you want to be absolutely sure that you've got it, especially in the day of the eclipse. Here's a bonus. If you take a whole bunch of pictures, you can stack them together and actually extract way more detail using software. You don't have to, you can just, if you just take a bunch of pictures now, you can decide later whether you want to bother with the software. At the apex of the eclipse, at the totality, things will get really dark, at least if you're in that part of North America where you get that. You can take your filter off at this point. So keep that in mind as you're planning. If you're in the path of the totality, you're gonna to wanna to be able to take it off. So just have it available so you can reach it. For me, I put it on this lens hood here so I can just take the lens hood off real quick. And then you wanna put it back on before it gets too sunny. Notice that I'm using a really tall tripod. That's because the camera's gonna be pointed up in the air, which means either I can lay on the ground and look up at it, or I can get a tall tripod that's taller than me so I can be more comfortable. To see these steps written down and to get a printable checklist, visit sdp.io slash solar. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about photography, including astrophotography, check out my book, Stunning Digital. Okay, so, um,
Tony and Chelsea, by the way, uh, have been doing uh, YouTube videos for years, and uh, uh, they're awesome. Uh, they cover the whole gamut of uh, photography topics. Uh, she's a wedding photographer and portrait photographer. He's more of a gadget guy. Uh, but their videos and their representation are in the free stuff on YouTube. And there's years of it. It's just you know, outstanding. So it's, and, and there's a new video every week, uh, which I love you know, watching. Learn something all the time. They're, they're great. OK, one more video. So 2017's total solar eclipse over North America is almost upon us. Uh, I've been out practicing with some equipment, doing some more research, scouting locations, and I wanted to do a little follow-up video to my photographing the total eclipse uh, video with just some things that I've learned along the way. I want to talk about equipment, I want to talk about safety, I want to talk about filters, and I want to talk about the importance of practicing a little bit. Uh, one thing, right off the bat, in my earlier video, I recommended using a 10-stop filter like this Solus 3.0 10-stop neutral density filter if you're not going to have a dedicated solar filter, which is kind of a limiting utility except for photographing the sun. One of the nice things about neutral density filters is they'll protect your sensor from the sun, but then they're really useful for doing long exposures and all kinds of photographic applications. Well, most of the camera manufacturers and a number of people have come out saying 16-stop is really the safe bet for the eclipse, especially if you're going to be using a longer lens filling the frame and, and running your sensor with uh, live view for a while. The 16 stop is a sure bet for saving your sensor from any damage from the sun. So I'm going to amend that earlier video, say a 16 stop filter is probably the way to go. Uh, and I'll put some links up to this. Hoya uh, sent me a Pro ND 5.0. 16 stop neutral density filter to, to play around with and I've been using it with some adapters. I got an 82 millimeter, which is the same size as my widest uh, you know, filter mount on, on the lens that I have. And I found it works really, really well. So that's one thing for protecting your sensor. I can't, can't, can't reiterate enough. If you're gonna be looking up at the sun at all, utilize either really strong grade welding glasses or get these cheap eclipse glasses. I've got a link to Amazon. They're, they're easy to grab. You know, they look a little dorky like you're in a 3D movie, but you can look right up at the sun safely without damaging your eyes. And these are a great help. You know, I slap these things on, get the camera on the tripod, and, and just get it kind of lined up where it's pointed pretty close to dead on the sun. Another thing that really helps, you know, once you've got it kind of close to lined up, you're going to use live view. You slap your 16 stop neutral density filter in front of your in front of your camera to make sure you're protecting the sensor. You flip to live view. Keep a baseball hat on because it's going to protect you from that sun beating into your face while you're looking up at the live view. Um, I found that I liked working with my Nikon D500 a little bit better than the D810 because it has an articulating screen and I could tip that out and have it pointing in a different direction so I'm looking straight into it and the sun's coming down into the camera. You know, that artic art articulating screen is really, really nice for just angling into the eclipse and not looking up into the sun all the time. But a baseball hat with a brim is a really, really nice thing. The 16-stop filter is great. You go into live view, you can focus it on the back of the camera, you can get your, your composition set up. And you know, there's really two main ways that we're gonna think about photographing this eclipse. Either you're gonna use a long lens, try to fill the frame and get that corona and go, you know, a whole bunch of stops. I would say that it, you know, ISO 100, uh, and say, you know, F11, you're probably gonna want to, to bracket around say a fifteenth of a second during totality, as many stops as you can, two stops apart. So if you, if you think about maybe seven or nine steps of bracketing with fifteenth of a second in the middle, a lot of people have been asking me for what's the proper exposure. I'll also set up a link. For those people that are really into getting that, that close-up of the eclipse, there's a great website, uh, Mr. Eclipse, and I'm going to put that in, in the comments. That guy has a great little tutorial on all the kind of formulations for what you want to do to capture the eclipse in its totality. My interest lies a lot more in capturing a cool landscape at the moment of totality with stars, the eclipse. I still want to bracket that landscape, so I have shadow detail and I have the corona and the sun. They'll be a little smaller in the frame, but I want them kind of in the context of the landscape. I want to capture the place where I am. And you know, I still haven't decided, am I going to be on the coast? Am I going to be on the east side of the mountains in the desert here in Oregon? 
Am I going to be in the Mid-Willamette Valley? And a lot of that's weather dependent, and I'm still kind of scouting scenes. But there are four main lenses I've found that work really well for me without a lot of ghosting or flare. Let me just stop there. So I did a search for the last eclipses we had about exactly what he said. We're all going to see pictures of the totality, and we're going to see it just with the corona. But that's going to open for those few seconds, maybe even up to 30 seconds, uh, an atmosphere, a, a potential of taking a picture that you hardly see, right? You see every, what, 40 years maybe? You know, it's gonna be really the middle of the day, it's gonna be really dark outside, you know, relatively speaking, and you know, don't pick a location where in the background you have some industrial stuff and whatever. Um, it'd be cool to that, or the sun image would just be, you know, framed by landscape somehow, right? So that's kind of cool. Don't just think about the, the, the image itself of the sun in an in eclipsed mode. Um, you know, I'm looking eager, you know, I'm gonna have like three setups. I'm looking, you know, to, to set up so that even something simple, maybe uh, trees with a pond to try to get some sort of a reflection going, you know, something cool um, because they don't exist, you know, everyone is, and I shouldn't say everyone, 95% of the folks out there will be transfixed on getting that eclipse that they forget about everything they've learned in photography class, right? So use some of that. Try to, you know, uh, Tony said practice. You know, practice during the day with your setup. Maybe, you know, don't go during that one hour of the eclipse and trying to figure out how to do something new, right? Uh, another thing that, that Tony said was, um, uh, the, the more magnification you have, the bigger it is in your image, which is awesome, but the more jittery it's going to be if you're touching your camera, because at high magnification, every little jitter shows. Um, and again, you're going to be moving this, right? Because in, in a minute, at 600 millimeters, it's off the screen already in one minute. This is going to last about an hour. So you're going to have to constantly be moving your camera to point to the sun. Uh, and taking pictures. So there's, you know, it's awesome to be able to take it at 1,000 or 1,200 millimeters, which is not outrageous for some of our setups. You know, he was using, what, 2,000 millimeters to fill the entire screen. Uh, but there's, there's, you know, that's a, a great pro, but there's cons to that, right? The bigger it is, the more jittery it is, the more tracking you have to do, and so forth. The smaller it is, the more minutes you have of not having to keep moving your camera, you just crop that, that space around it. Okay, so some really good points. But yeah, this was, um, you know, I haven't started the place uh, where I'm going to be yet, but you know, I'm going to go there the day before and kind of find my spot, right? You know, most people, you know, everyone's going to be in the university, and if you've been in that university, it's got a lot of buildings, it's got a lot of uh, uh, industrial stuff to the north, um, so it, it's not a great location uh, unless you can frame it around trees or something. So scout the, the place you are because during the minute of totality, it'll, it'll give you an opportunity to, to landscape it, right? You stick a wide lens on there and take a cool picture of it, which I have not been able to find doing Google search, but I do find thousands of pictures of the close inside for shooting into bright conditions. They throw nice sun stars if I want the partial eclipse, just to kind of set it off in the landscape. And I've been practicing that by just using anything like a building, a mountain, any kind of structure that's creating a shadow line at about the same time as the eclipse is gonna be with the sun at about the same height in the sky. And just finding that shadow line, setting the camera and tripod up so that that shadow line's right across where the camera is in the shadow of the camera, and then, you know, using the same technique I just talked about, you know, use these Eclipse glasses, use your 16 stop filter, use the, the live view in the back of your camera, just get it, your camera moved into a position where the sun is partially obscured. You know, I've done it out here with my studio, the roof of my studio, blocking half of the sun, and, and then practice with stopping down and exposing a little bit and seeing how the lens handles sun stars. Does it give a lot of ghosting? Does it give a lot of flare? Does it kind of mess the image up having that bright point source? Because it's not going to do a very good job during the partial eclipse if it's doing that for you right now. And you can test that just using a shadow line. And I'll just say that from my research, the lenses that have been working really, really well for me 
are my Nikon 14 to 24, unfortunately. That doesn't take any filters, so it's not going to be of great utility to me. Um, instead, I've been using this Tokina. It's made for APS-C for a smaller sensor format like my D500, 11 to 20. This has about the nicest Sunstar of any lens I've ever used. A friend of mine has one. He was doing these videos and photographs with these incredible Sunstars, so I got a hold of one. Absolutely love the way it performs throwing Sunstars, and it does a really job, good job of just not ghosting and flaring, so it's going to be nice for this eclipse. Uh, I was testing out some other Tokina lenses, and this one for Sony, this is a new series that they've got for the Sony E-mount. The uh, Firin 20 millimeter, it's a manual focus lens, really nicely made, beautiful lens, just kind of in every application I've used it on. It does also a really nice job with low ghosting, low flare, really nice sun star. Um, my Zeiss 35 F2 is another lens that I like a lot. It's done a really good job and in test with the, uh, just kind of testing for the eclipse, it's done a nice job. And then the other one that I really like is my Nikon 50. 1.8, uh, and that lens just does a great job throwing sun stars. It can get a little ghosting and flare if you get too much point source light in it, but I think it'll be nice as the eclipse gets closer and closer to totality. And you know, I don't know which ones of these lenses I'm going to use until I get to the location that I've chosen for sure for the eclipse, and some of that is going to be weather dependent. You know, I would suggest you pick the number of places where you're going to be for this eclipse. And, and keep an eye on the weather and be flexible. You know, if you're choosing to be on the coast and you see a big marine layers coming in for that day, move inland. Uh, if you're going to be on one side of the mountains and you see that it's supposed to be cloudy on that side, drive over to the other side, car camp. You know, get into a spot where you have the best possibility of seeing it. Um, I think. You know, there's nothing wrong with capturing a long lens image of this. I'm going to use this Nikon, the latest version of the 300 f4, partially just because it takes a filter. It'll work really well with the 16 stop neutral density, and it's razor sharp. It's lightweight. It's nice and easy to use, and it works well with the teleconverter. So I've been practicing with this. It's done a really good job. There's nothing wrong with going for that close up of the sun, and I think I'm going to have two cameras and just make sure I get one image of that. Again, you're going to want to bracket. I think the landscape shot is a little trickier. It's still going to take a lot of bracketing. It's a little bit of more of an artistic decision based on what the landscape that you're photographing is. That's the shot that excites me. I think there's going to be a whole lot of close ups of this eclipse. I don't think it's going to be a rare image. I think that you're going to be more differentiated by finding an interesting landscape and going with a, a sort of a medium wide to medium shot with the eclipse in it in an interesting landscape. You know, some cool foreground, some cool background, and then the eclipse happening, maybe some stars during totality. That's what excites me. Uh, anyhow, so. The biggest point I think there is, is get up there, practice, use your equipment, get comfortable with it. The sun is there right now. It's easy for you to play with. Just make sure you protect your eyes with good eclipse glasses or welding glasses. Protect your sensor with a good 16 stop neutral density filter. Get up there, practice, and particularly practice in a couple days before the eclipse. It's happening on a Monday. There's no reason not to take that weekend and practice for it. Make sure that you know what you're doing at the hour that it's happening and you have the place that you want to be what lens you want to use, and you know how to use it. Another great uh, series about how to use it. He does a lot of, he's more of a techie guy, but he does you know, beautiful uh, uh, videos on YouTube, and most of it is free. Um, so even here in, um, you know, around Elgin, we have, uh, you know, talk about landscaping. We have the river. Uh, we have so many forest preserves. Uh, with ponds that you can go. Uh, one of my favorites is either Blackwell, and uh, it's closer to West Chicago. Um, but uh, Fabian has uh, that huge font, you know, off of, uh, uh, I forget the roads, but uh, it's, uh, it's got that huge pond just off the entrance, um, right behind the campfire, and with the beautiful uh, trees around it, and the big decks. And I'm sure a lot of these beautiful places that we have around here will be, we'll have a lot of folks on there. It is the middle of the day on Monday, so maybe, maybe not. But, you know, uh, totality is going to get dark, but here, the advantage of Chicago, some of the pictures that he showed, right, we're going to get those flares that he simulated by simply, you know, now, having the sun with a bit, you know, close to a building, and you get the eclipse look that you can practice on, uh, right? So, um, you know, do that, and, you know, like I said, I'm going to have several cameras with me, 
um, that I will try to uh, not only get an image of the uh, solar disk itself, but I, you know, when it's the darkest part, have a, a camera ready on a tripod to, to try to get a beautiful landscape shot. Uh, up here, where it's not going to be total, so you'll see uh, you know, a, a flaring occur, and you'll have that uh, projection onto water. Or uh, I, I have some uh, religious friends that are going to use the church just there, uh, and you know, down here in downtown Elgin. And because it's got that beautiful stained glass, um, and they've been out there trying to get, you know, how the sun, the sun's gonna be close to the southern sky to go through that or eliminate some of that stained glass in their image. You know, it's huge opportunities just here in our uh, in our neighborhoods for this event. It's just kind of, and we have several days to kind of figure what we want to do, right? Um, in some of the simulators that we have online, that's really exactly in the sky where it's going to be on Monday. You know, if you're looking to the south, it's going to be a little bit to the right of that. Anyway, um, you, you'll know, you can go online to see exactly where the sun is going to be between 12.30 and 1.30, and then just kind of walk around and figure out where you're going to be. Right? If it's a great place, I'm sure you're not going to be alone out there. <laughs> a lot of other people are going, to, are going to be there. So it's a great opportunity to take a beautiful pictures for something that happens literally once or twice in a lifetime. Right? Um, Solar eclipses don't happen very often to us. All right, um, running out of time, sorry, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so here is uh, one of my smaller telescopes. It's, uh, it's called a Max Tov. Uh, it's 1,800 millimeters. Uh, it's really, uh, it's, it's very heavy. It's a lot of compressed glass in here. <laughs> so that's why it gives you 1,800 millimeters. It's a reflector. Uh, so light comes in and bounces back and forth through several layers of glass before the image comes out to your eyepiece. Okay, and this balancing back and forth basically extends, kind of like that, uh, what is it, optic? That $100, 1,000 millimeter lens that goes for 100 bucks. Um, kind of the same concept, except that, you know, the quality of glass is astronomically different. <laughs> um, so, the same concept, this is 1,800 millimeters. Um, I use this a lot for the moon. Uh, I also use this a lot for uh, a dense star clusters. Uh, because of the magnification, it's really easy to take pictures of. Uh, put it in here, secure it. Uh, this tripod, by the way, goes twice the, so the height. It will come way up to here, and it's pretty steady. It must weigh close to 100 pounds. Probably not, it just feels like it's 100 pounds. It's an actual surveyor's uh, tripod. Yeah, yeah that some, uh, an actual surveyor was, was uh, at a star party. Uh, he was retiring. He, I had a flimsy start, uh, uh, a tripod at the time with my refractor telescope. You know, that looks like a model uh, uh, telescope. And uh, uh, he took pity on me where all these guys had these $1,000 know, outfits. I had this little, you know, starting out 20 years ago. He goes, you know what? Uh, you know, for, I don't remember, $100 or $200. You know, I got that. I'm retiring. I got the surveyors. Yeah, I'm too old to be carrying this around. You want it? I'm like, yeah, um, and as you can see, the thing is immaculate, and I've, I've tried to keep it um, as beautiful as possible, and it used to go out every single weekend with me to our uh, astronomy things. It does weigh a ton, literally, and it's solid oak or whatever these things are, um, but it's, it's remarkable. Anyway, tripod, uh, telescope is on there. This is a uh, William Optics head um, that I put on there, and it's screwed perfectly uh, onto the surveyors. Uh, tripod, and you can see I can move this around. When I extend the lens, this is about here, and it's rock, rock steady. So obviously they put their survey equipment, and it has to be rock steady, right? Or else if it moves, they would not survey very well. Um, so uh, it works like that. So you're going to ask me, how do I attach this to that, right? Uh, it's very simple. Several ways of doing this. You might hear eyepiece projection, a uh, very popular way. Uh, basically, if I had an eyepiece uh, on here, I would put it on the eyepiece and take pictures. I don't like eyepiece projection um, because there's an extra piece of glass between this and that, right? The eyepiece. The nice thing about it, it's easy to focus because you're focusing. You can look at it, focus, put this, adjust the focus a little bit because you're only another inch away and off you go. So make eyepiece projection lets you focus easily. Uh, I don't like that. I use uh, direct projection. So, 
couple of pieces here. This is called the inner thing here, and I think I welded on here because I can't take it off. There's an inner ring here. It's called a T-ring. It's very, very popular. It used to exist decades and decades ago, maybe in the 50s, where they used to attach uh, equipment, uh, optical equipment, onto any in, uh, you know, uh, laboratory device. And it was standard 10, 20 threads. Uh, it was an industry standard. It's called a T-thread. And you know, it costs a few bucks. You can get them anywhere. Um, so the inside is a T-thread. The outside is a cannon mount. Okay, just get a cannon mount for a T-thread, put the T-thread in there, and you have a cannon mount. So you look at this, I'm like, what? What does this do? Cannon camera. This is a 40D? Yeah, an old trusty photography, astrophotography 40D. So take this, and again, this is a, a cannon mount attached to a T-ring, and it simply goes and on as a lens would. Okay? Pretty simple. It comes off like a lens would. Okay. Now, what you put on the T-ring is, again, it's an industry standard. A million things can attach to here, right? Um, here's one of the things. This is simply a uh, inside adapter for a telescope. I use this a lot for my refractors. I put this like this. This is not a refractor, but then this would mount in here, and off I go. I'm basically using the telescope as my lens, okay? And then when I focus, I mean, this is one of the advantages. I've got, I've got a 200 millimeter F3 telescope, and someone that asks, why don't you use a 300 millimeter F2 lens? It's the same thing. Um, it is, but one is created to, to photograph an object at infinity versus a lens which was not created for that. It can probably do a very good job, but that's not what it was created to do. Right? Um, I can easily focus this for something at infinity and do some micro focusing in that, where you can't do that you know, with an actual lens. Okay, I'm not gonna use this. I don't have a refractor right now. But same exact thing, take this off. And simply attach this to this. Again, those threads are standard, industry standard for a T-thread. And then click this in. The red is on top, and then a cannon is this one. There you go. And just make sure everything's nice and tight. There you go. And since it's a telescope, I can bounce it by moving it forward since I got extra weights. And I can move it, not by moving this, this is secured and locked in. Just move the telescope. Hmm. So, I have a tracking mount, an astronomical tracking mount. Basically, what that is, it's a mount, instead of going, this is heavy, so I'm going to take this off because I always say, oh my god, it's going to fall. And it has on one of my telescopes fall. Okay, there you go. Um, a tracking mount is, there are, there's two terms, it's called alt as, um, it's X and Y, so you can see it only moves in two directions, right, Y and X. Um, an alt as is a polar alignment, so basically it only moves one direction because it uh, moves with the way the stars move in the sky, which is a you know, circumcircular direction around the North Star, close to the North Star. Um, and it's a polar mount, it basically takes this and just kind of looks it up, and we're what, at 30, 43 degrees north? So, you know, this thing is at an angle of 43 degrees, and then you plug it in, and it will follow the sun for as long as you want it to, okay? So that is a tracking uh, mount. That's what I'm going to use to video the, the, the for my video set. Um, I use that telescope, uh, that setup a lot. It's, it gets very, very fancy since I've been doing this for so long. I love shooting nebulas, which are basically two to three hour exposures. You obviously can't shoot two to three hours for that. You have to be able to track something for that long. So I have a guide scope. <laughs> I have a scope, I'm a scope. My guide scope basically tells my main scope, hey, you're off by three pixels, move your butt over. And, it's, and the hunt will move it over three pixels. And it'll keep that image centered for hours, right? Um, and those are very, very popular in the astronomy world. They go anywhere from 
$500 to $10,000, depending on how heavy of equipment you want to put on. If you're just talking a refractor or you know a 500 millimeter telescope with a camera, you get away with you know, four or five hundred dollars for a tracking mount because that setup is not heavy. Um, I think this telescope is heavier than one we had. So um, the heavier the setup, uh, the more expensive the pump mount gets because it's got to be able to carry that equipment for hours. So that's and it, it works off of a car battery for hours. So I'll have a car battery out there with my tracking mount. Uh, tracking the, the sun for that hour long. Um, I won't need any correction because for an hour it'll shoot it with no problem. I'll have this with me with my uh, longest possible uh, lens, which is my 500 millimeter. And just to take intermittent shots, I do have another uh, solar filter film for that one. And then and I'll have another carry one. Um, and I created a, um, it was very, it was that, um, uh, gradiated density setup. I don't know if you ever see it. It's a piece of glass that mounts in front of your lenses that gives you a gradiated um, uh, a glass so that you can take s the sun and I used to use it, now we just do it in, in, in uh, Photoshop. But you can take beautiful pictures of the sun and your landscape photography without you know, having to change between the, the dynamic ranges of the two, right? This, this, the, the, the earth and the top part. It was very cheap. It's, um, it literally screws in front of any lens, any filter comes with multiple filters, and it's just a clip that you can put this piece of uh, radiator filter in front of it. And it comes with different colors and all this craziness. I have a little four by four uh, cut batter film that I can just put in there. Um, and that works, that'll work for my landscape one. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. Um, hopefully we'll have good weather right now. It says partly to mostly cloudy on Monday for the entire Midwest. I have friends that are going to Kentucky, um, and I think the more east you go, the worse the weather is going to get. Um, we can all go to Oregon, I think, and, and, and have a good time out there, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so hopefully we'll have great weather. Um, you don't have to get anything fancy. I mean, you saw the second video, you used everyday stuff. Um, especially up here, since we're going to have those beautiful flares uh, occurring in, during the eclipse, you can really take some beautiful landscape photography during that moment. You know, you don't have to get fancy equipment. Uh, but I just wanted to show you some of the stuff that's available. Okay, Bob, any questions? Who is actually gonna take some time off to photograph? Okay, the nice thing is it's, it is around lunch hour, right? So, yeah, <laughs> so it's perfect. <laughs> Sorry, boss, I'm gonna take a little extra lunch time. Might get a little dark around here, but don't worry about it. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it turned out. You wanna uh, talk about the glasses, how they tell the cheap Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I did have a slide. I think I just put the slide in the wrong place. Yep, I put it in the, nope. I put it in, I thought I put a slide. Okay, so there's two, there's American Scientific, and there is, um, ISO. Oh, I'm sorry? Um, yeah, there's two brand names. I don't have internet access. I would go online and show you. I thought I had. Um, but as long as they're ISO certified, um, and there's two very popular ones. I forget the name of the second one. They just do solar stuff. Um, so as long as there's, you know, they say they're certified, and it doesn't look like the film is going to, the glue is so poor it's just going to fly off the glasses. But yeah. also there's something about if you, you should be able to shine an LED flashlight right into the lens, and if you can see that light at all, then they are um, counterfeit. Yeah, you should not be able to see a flashlight through welding glasses. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, that, that, that yeah. LED, a bright LED, all you should be able to see when you put it on is the sun. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I mean, something with 16 or more density, you should not be able to see a flashlight in front of it. So if you can, I'd be suspect. Amazon gave us a refund because they said they couldn't certify that the glasses were good. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But they're good. We did the test. That's so. good. Yeah. Now you're going to go blind. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you.